Okay, let's start. Thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Peter Dubois. I'm a managing partner in Plus. I'll talk about that a bit. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about the blueprint for an API connected and event driven enterprise. Now, you've been having so many events and APIs already today, and probably your whole expert. So, this is actually a presentation that I have in a different format, but with similar content given to customers. So it's more like, okay, how do we talk to customers about these things at a higher level, like from an architecture perspective, enterprise architecture perspective, rather than like I would talk to you as experts. So most of the content, obviously, you will know. Um, I just hope that you can appreciate the angle that we're going through here. Okay, so this is the right set expectations. I had the uh, opportunity to watch at least one uh, other presentation. And so there is definitely overlap, but the, the angle is different. Okay, so um, this is a blueprint and it's on the USS Sulaco. Anybody knows what that is? When I do this, you can do that if you know the answer to the questions. No, then you have to use Google, but I'm not going to tell you. So enough about this. I have also an issue with the clicker, it seems. Let me try. Maybe the other. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's talk about me. Um, I'm managing partner at X Plus. Uh, what that means is, this is ruining my slides. Uh, it means I work at nights and weekends, basically every night and every weekend. Um, I have 25 years experience in IT, of which 20 years in IT architecture. That means I've seen things you wouldn't believe. It is also a course somewhere. Worked for IBM 11 years and four years uh, for Ortis. Uh, that means big and complex doesn't scare me. And finally, I've done an MBA at the University of Chicago, which is really nice. Um, if my clicker really wants to work, this is not going well. So I'm going to do it from here. Um, it's really nice to, if you have to talk to business, and it's especially nice if somebody else paid for it. So what do I do? I typically um, turn dinosaurs into dragons. So that's what I help customers with. Uh, and if you get the reference. Uh, who is X Plus? Uh, we're a um, uh, consultancy, an IT consultancy specialized in IT architecture and um, program management. We're probably the largest in the Benelux with more than 100 uh, senior consultants. Um, we work typically in larger companies, but we also work for smaller companies, like I work both for Fortis as for um, the Hawaiian Pokeball, so there is a kind of wide berth, and especially in the uh, way of working, which is nice. Um, and uh, as you can see, this is a very bland building our headquarters, that's because nobody's ever there, and that's why it's a perfect building for us because we're always working with our customers. So let's dive right in. Um, the first object is uh, business doesn't care about your events and your APIs uh, and your event-driven architectures. What business cares about is um, doing business. Doing business means how do we position ourselves in the market? How do we create competitive advantages? How do we make money? How can we decrease costs and how do we manage our risks while not alienating too much of our customer base? That's what business is interested in. So when you want to talk technology, which is what we are doing, then you need to find an angle that fits into that. So the angle that I'm going to use here is time to market. Business finds it very important to be able to bring new products uh, to market in a short possible uh, time. And so one of the ways you can sell that uh, vision is by saying from an IP, IT perspective, well, everything is getting more digital. So if we can create new customer journeys, which means customer experience functions for customers, by reusing as much as possible building blocks that we already have and only adapt or create the new building blocks that we need and orchestrate them together into a new customer journey, that is an important way in which you can achieve this. And that's so the angle that we're going to take here. And in taking this angle, I'm going to bring you through this whole story of how um, we use all these technologies in the end to achieve this. Now, composable applications, uh, which is what we're talking about here, is sort of the holy grail from IT. Oh, we're talking about reusability, modularity, 
um, business functions nicely uh, separated, standardized and reusable interface, so it's not new at all. It's always been the holy grail. Um, it already existed sort of on the mainframe for people who are old enough to ever have touched that or have been involved in that. There it was more technologically constraints that drove them there because you had the INS transaction manager who was um, basically ordering all the applications like now you can run, now you can run, now you can run in time slices and the process was controlled in two at the same time, which means that every application should finish in a single amount of time, otherwise all the other new applications had to wait. And so that was one thing that made all these way from applications sort of from uh, having a single function and doing one thing in about the same uh, amount of time, and they were um, they were sort of optimized for that. And then for the green screens, like the 3270s, the access and mainframe, the access the true structure theories, but they then orchestrate the other ones to call to all the other applications. So it's a kind of a composable green screen application where you go from screen to screen is a kind of composable application, you could say. Now, obviously, there you are limited by the vertical scalability of a mainframe, as if that is really a problem for most companies. Uh, but the market shows differently, and mainframe is not really viable anymore, at least not as a new uh, thing. 15 years ago, um, we had service-oriented architecture. The market was going to big packages like SAP and Siebel for CRM and all these type of things, PeopleSoft and so on. And so if they wanted to have a customer journey or a business process implemented, well, they needed to have functionality from one application using another application and so on. And then the idea was, well, we cannot pull that functionality out, but we can expose it with standard web services. Uh, Sometimes that was not possible and you needed to have a custom adapter in there. And so then they added an enterprise service bus in between that sort of this is the routing and the mediation, which means the transformation from one point and another for you. But otherwise, after a while, most of the things had web services. Now, that um, is a way of a composable application in the end, if you look at it overall, uh, where you can create a journey, a business process using different applications. Um, it was though mostly a middleware vendor type of play where all these standards were set by the IBMs and the Oracles and the other projects and the subset of JS, but it became really too heavy. And then there was, of course, a backlash from open source, and um, that's where we are today. So today there is this new world that started, as we know, with the Facebooks, Amazon, uh, Apple, Netflix, and Googles that needed, uh, for which none of these um, None of these commercial offerings were good enough and way too expensive anyway, so they developed themselves stuff, they brought that into open source, and it was really made initially for internet scale applications. Um, but that technology is actually pretty useful also for companies, right? Um, and that's how this is today bleeding into the larger business environment because a lot of these things have become open source and were open source and have also become there's an ecosystem around it of services and I think a good chunk of you are part of that ecosystem and to make sure that it works at the customers and that's where we are today. So we have a whole new technology stack that was there um, and it was sandwiched between mobile and cloud so what we see is mobile, API management, microservice architecture, event driven architecture, data data, or we'll call it data hub, and then DevOps that make sure that everything got much more automated in development, wrapped in a cloud, and surrounded by security. We're going to focus here on the API management, microservice architecture, and event driven architecture. The question is, how does all that support composable applications? Because that was the original question. Um, it all doesn't go to work, so I'm going to. So we have more quickly the evolution from monolithic over service-oriented architecture to what we then call microservices. I'd like to start with that. And at the main, main time of monolithic uh, application like SAP, you had really tight couple monolithic package together. You had one common platform, you had a centralized team, and then you went over course rate of, uh, decoupling, where it was mostly about integration mediation with teams that were then first slice basically organized. Today you have these multidisciplinary teams um, where we talk about 
um, uh, fine grained independent building blocks and where we use these standard uh, APIs and events. And so what we see is a migration from high cohesion and low flexibility to much lower cohesion and higher flexibility. And one of the problems that we need to solve there, or one of the things that we gives us much more liberty, but it's also like how do you manage that liberty? So let's talk about uh, microservices quickly first. Microservices, they enable your com uh, composability because what they do, what they have as a function is like we're going to implement a single business function somewhere, at a certain level of granularity in an independent application. This is actually a drawing of a function genius, um, and it's really useful. And so each of these green things there, this works. Each of these green things there is a microservice, and it's independent from the others. There's a network in between, and each of these microservices has its own data. That's kind of the theory. Uh, um, and the network access, because we're separated by network, is standardized by APIs. The advantages, they are independently evolvable, they're independently deployable. You can say, hey, I have an independent team that creates them, so they are not really uh, bothered by the other teams, and that's, that's the goal behind that. Um, Especially in the age of Agile, which we are now like 10 years, I think, that we have a move to Agile. I think ING was the first one who did it at scale in 2013-14 time frame. So it's sort of 10 years, it's really in the business environment that it's there. You have Conway's Law. Conway's Law posits that your uh, application landscape or your IT landscape looks like your organization. It's like you see the organization of Mercedes reflected in the dashboard type of thing. Um, and so if you go Asia with small independent teams, then microservices are a natural output of that. Okay, now the question always is, and this is where we get architects coming, it's like, okay, it's all fine talking about microservices, I'll just start, you know, all your courses well going. What you need to say is like, what is your granularity? What is your scope of your microservices? What are you going to put there? What do you put together? What do you leave uh, away from each other? And so there it's important to connect the software that you develop as a microservice with your business domains. Things have to have a logic from the business out. Yeah? Um, and the tools that we use there very much is something called a capability map, a business capability map, where as a kind of Russian uh, dolls principle, you're going to look at big domains, business domains, and then within these business domains, you have level two domains, and then level three if you want, and so on and so on, until you say, well, this is a nice uh, scope uh, environment function that is independent from the rest, that is, uh, and that we could develop as one or more microservices. Um, you can also enrich that by wondering like which data belongs to this microservice uh, and not to another one is by using a business glossary um, and or an enterprise data model. With an enterprise data model, I'm not talking about a canonical data model. I'm talking just in general about, okay, in the business you have some data objects, larger data objects, and they are related to other ones. Uh, but they also could be like, okay, I have one in sales, I have one in marketing, I have one in fulfillment. We all talk about the customer, but in our different contexts. And so you have this principle of what we call bounded context, like what does it mean to be a customer in sales versus what does it mean to be a customer in uh, fulfillment, for example. Microservices, all the food, I mean, I'm on a diet, so you can see bleeding into my presentation. Um, Sorry, not sorry. Um, so microservices are, talk, are not just like, oh, which business function is it? Microservices have also logical layers. So at the, close, so at the top, when you're feeding your uh, mobile application, you probably have what we call a facade microservice that uh, collects all the data necessary to fill the screens, specific for your screen. Um, below that, you could have your customer journey microservice that orchestrates your customer journey. And below that, you could have one that um, um, has all your from multiple that execute your business functions, your business functionality, your business logics. And below that, you could have one that accesses the actual data and manages that one. Depending on performance characteristics and um, um, management and, 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 and assembly of data and how everything below is managed, you could have multiple layers. So there's no hard and fast rule, it's just a recognition that you have these logical layers too. 
Yeah. Now, um, and it also supports things like separation of concerns, obviously. So with this, you have the basis to create composable applications or at least the building blocks for that. Um, so in the end, I talked about um, an orchestration microservice, and that's how you could compose your um, your um, uh, your component your customer journey. And so that orchestration microservice could just orchestrate centrally uh, all your uh, the customer journey, all the other microservices. That's one way. You could work also much lighter. You could directly do it in a single page application in your browser, where the whole control flow is basically managed in from your browser out and calling the uh, task microservices uh, one by one directly. That's also good. Um, you could also say, no, um, I don't want a central point. I want a choreography. That means one microservice calls another, calls another, it calls another. In a certain context, and giving one microservice a certain call, it triggers off a chain that, in the end, is like a choreography, like a ballet, where you have two people who are not orchestrated but who do suddenly kind of a dance. What we typically want there is a tool at least that um, monitors, not intervenes, but at least monitors where you are in that implicit process. I would say. Um, you could also involve tools that do case management, where the order is not important, it's just everything has to be done before you can really finalize. So, so there's all these types of different forms of orchestrating choreography and so on that you could do, and which you could embed into these microservices. So each person can create its own customer journey, which is a collection of other orchestrations that have been made before. Um, and, and that way you can sort of orchestrate uh, your entire uh, customer journey. So this is, and, and the important message here is you don't need a big monolithic application like we used to, and you have embedded uh, tools for that, like Samunda and that type of sort of things. Um, now, okay, we have these logical ideas about microservices. We're going to actually write code. We're going to deploy that code in what we call containers. Containers allow us to provide some application level virtualization where you put all the dependencies together and you can deploy those independently because you have all the dependencies together. And so it has a much smaller footprint than, for example, uh, using virtual machines like you have tens of megabytes rather than tens of gigabytes. Um, okay, now I have my very, what used to be a very big monolithic application, and now I have like tens of containers. I'm going to deploy these manually one by one. How do I monitor that? How do I manage that? Enter the concept of a container orchestrator. By the way, these pictures are made with the AI, so it's really fun to do that. Uh, <laughs> So these orchestrators, what they do is, at the moment that you tell it to do, it's going to say, assemble all the files from a repository that represent the container. You want to deploy it on a number of machines that you tell, hey, I want it on one, two, three, four machines with these performance characteristics or resource characteristics, and it's going to start it up, and it's going to see that it runs. And when something is wrong, it's going to stop it, and it's starting somewhere else, so it's going to monitor its life cycle, basically. Um, that's nice. At this moment, all my containers are running, but how do I manage the traffic between my containers? Because we're talking about an interaction, an orchestration of different containers to create this uh, new uh, customer journey in a flexible way. And to what we call a service mesh. A service mesh manages all the microservices traffic. So what it does is, hey, I'm a microservice, and I need to call another microservice. Oh, thanks to this property from the service mesh, I know where it is. So I'm going to call it. So I'm going to call it. Um, it's also going to help me with the routing of that request. It's also going to help me with security because you can have rules, policies that say this microservice may call that microservice, but that microservice may not call this microservice. You can also help with uh, encrypting the traffic. You also help with logging all the technical logging. So basically, what you do with service mesh is you take a number of the transversal infrastructure cons uh, concerns out of the application, the microservice itself, and you put it somewhere else. So what is it somewhere else? So the sidecar. Sidecar is also a container that you deploy together with the uh, actual application level microservice and in an atomic way. And these orchestrators uh, that we talked about uh, help you with that. 
and so they are basically deployed as a unit. Um, and that's basically how these uh, things uh, run together. So if we bring that in uh, what we an architecture type of block diagram, uh, that customers like to see in order to understand it better, we have a container orchestrator, orchestrated container in which microservices are, uh, uh, which contain microservices, which could be composable application orchestration uh, engine with, with this configuration and which are coordinated with the service mesh. Let's ensure that, for instance, logging is made, uh, is happening. Um, and these things used in the end storage and legacy connect to legacy applications. So this, this part of the hamburger. Okay, now we're going to talk about APIs. APIs are actually the end where the microservices serve as the actual logic, uh, the way you cut the elephant in pieces. The APIs uh, are the en enabler for the um, composability. So we look about things like APIs as a contract. Uh, so it's a contract, it's a thing that you see above the waterline where the microservice itself is below the waterline. It's a microservice that owns the data, and the API gives access to the data through the microservice, where the microservice will manipulate the data before it gives an answer that is according to the contract that you made. So um, the advantage is that APIs don't have to change. Right? You can version APIs, and with a new version, if there's no big change, even though the implementation change, then everybody who uses the API, there's no issue. If the APIs change it enough, that, um, that if there is an issue for the applications, you need to change it to the version of it. Um, and you can run two. Microservice can run multiple versions of an API in the end, so that the old um, applications that use the old version can still use it for a while while they prepare themselves to move to the new version before they take commissions. So in the end, APIs are like any URL. Um, and you need to think about APIs not in the context of an integration thing, like I need data from you, give me an API. Uh, uh, in general, you. Um, um, give me an API, and that was how it was. Oh, you need these and these and these fields, and then I'll make an API for you. Oh, you get an API, so you get kind of, uh, you get an API, you get an API, you get an API. That's not the way. So you need to look at APIs because you have decomposed your uh, business business capability map all the way down. You say, okay, I have here a business function. What is the logical contract that belongs to that business function? So, so that it's also reusable. Yeah, but it doesn't have exactly what I want. Yeah, okay, I'm giving you enough and then it's up to you to do something with it. I'm not gonna do all work for you. So um, you need to think from API, you need to look at it as a product. That means you look at the business context where it is used, how it can be reusable, potentially monetizable. Um, and it's not to be looked at uh, from an integration context. Mm -hmm. So if you just for your internal APIs, there's no reason not to take that approach also, but you're going to look, look uh, use, sorry, you're going to use that domain-driven approach where you have decomposed your business according to these domains. And that's an internal thing. Your customers don't need to know. These are internal APIs. It's just you, internally in the company, that need to know, okay, am I calling a payment system? Am I calling uh, a fulfillment system? Am I calling an inventory? If you expose some of your APIs, like you do more and more uh, to the outside world, then it's more about branding. Then suddenly marketing should be involved because an API that you expose to the outside world is like a website. It's a window of the world. The world looks at you that API and say that is your company. And so there you have a whole different set of rules that you may use in order to construct your API, but that is specifically made to expose yourself to the outside world and to your customers. Sorry, I'm not sure. Okay. So um, as I said, the APIs also reflect your uh, domain driven design. There's an end missing. So when you create microservices, you could start with APIs. You should start with your APIs. You should start with your contract and then develop from there. And you should not put code in your uh, microservice that has nothing to do with the API because otherwise, why is it there? And the way you can design your API, at least the URL, is by using the same capabilities, enterprise data model, and then uh, relevant domain models in constructing the whole URL. Okay, this is your company, the internal. 
the internal URL, then you have your strategic area, which is your level one of your um, of your capability lab. Then you have a level two, okay. And in your enterprise data model, you might have okay, a specific objective or policy. There is a versioning so that when you change this to a major version and there is an impact, at least the URL is something else. And then for that particular uh, enterprise domain, our goal is there may be a domain specific data model. Why do I say a domain specific data model? Because the meaning of a car is and all the attributes for that domain may be different than um, uh, for another domain. And so in there, you may you construct that. So this is a formal way that we say this is how, or a similar way is the way that we say as architects that you best create your uh, APIs. In the end, these APIs are exposed by the microservices. And these are literally the plugs which you use to wire your application, your customer journey together. Yeah. Um, they are typically transactional in nature. Some of the people here have told that before. You could make some asynchronous, but that's the detail we're talking about. The service mesh will tell you where that endpoint resides and um, remote applications, and so applications from partners or customers come over us may access them through an API gateway, which the drawing is seen here at the top. One of the uh, promises of APIs as uh, contracts uh, exposing microservice functionality or even data is that it is uh, something that can really be used by low-code, no-code tools, where you give citizen developers the ability to create their own applications, their own customer journey. So it's not for the customer, it's probably for themselves, maybe in certain, probably in service of the customer, but they can create their own applications because the low-code, no-code tools give you all the business logic part, or at least the control logic and the GUI logic, and they connect to APIs. Uh, through entity microservices to connect to data, and they connect to business logic through task APIs that are running on top of task microservices. So in that way, you have the promise that I have a bunch of reusable uh, functionality, business logic, that's exposed by standardized APIs, which are published in a repository that people can look at. Uh, and find uh, that they can find, and then they can construct their own customer journey or their own application together. So that's the way in which a business can create much faster new applications windows to the market, especially if it's supported with a industry-wide development pipeline and with local code that is much more capabilities to their employees. Um, so we update the platform here with the APIs. So that's API Gateway, use and then the APIs on top of the microservices. And now we're going to check in. At events, we're going to supercharge microservices and uh, supporting choreography through events. So what we have with events is, and there was a good description of events at the session of 1 uh, p.m. here, uh, events they complement APIs in these modular applications. And so here you have the bus, here you have all the events. Does anybody know which movie this is? June, but the one of 1984. So events are asynchronous. Um, they, and this is really important, they capture and expose stage changes in an application. So an application, a microservice, it's an event, um, a call in the API, it does some, it gets some data from its database, it does some changes on the data, and then it stores it back in the database. The idea is to say, oh, this is a state change, I'm not just going to put it in my database, I will put it in my database because I have need for it, I will immediately send it out for others to use. And that is the new thing. What it happens is it sends it to a central broker, typically, and there it's put in an append only log. So there's a lot with all the state changes over this period of time. So you have a history. And then what happens is that other applications that are interested in that type of events listen to it and they react from it. All that reactive applications. So rather than going out myself and ask, hey, can you give me something which is transactional? I just listen. I do nothing. I'm just hanging there and I'm just listening on these events. And when the event is there, then I'll start doing something. 
There's not a responsibility of the one who sends out the events, which is what makes it different from typical purpose subscribe tools like NQ. It's the responsibility of the application that's listening to it. So event-driven architectures are about data sharing. They're not about data integration. And that's the conceptual different way of looking at it. So one of the nice things about event-driven architectures is that they really allow for some cool implementation patterns, uh, or sorry, data incentive patterns, like event streaming, which means like, hey, I send out an event, but it's not the format that you want, or it needs to be enriched. So you're going to have a number of steps in between where other components, small components, are going to read that event, adapt it, transform it, enrich it, put it back, and then in the next in line, and then it arrives at the place where another application says, now I can read it, and now I'm interested in it, and then we'll read it. Another one is event sourcing, where you basically use the whole thing as a database, where you have the whole log with all the state changes, and then at some point in time, you say, oh, well, I'm going to do some processing over the whole log. So that's kind of database type of usage, not entirely. I don't want to wait for the purists or enrich the purists here. Um, there is also a way of using this to decouple reads and writes. This is actually an important pattern for, let's say, I have a mainframe and it's very expensive because IBM milks me for what I'm worth. Uh, every transaction I pay, I use the space costs. And 90% of my transactions are actually just reads, not writes. So what I'm going to do is, every time somebody writes it on the mainframe, because that is the application that causes the transaction, I'm going to put that state change away on the broker, and then I'm going to put it somewhere in a data lake and expose it with an API. And when somebody needs to read it, which is 90% of the use cases, they're going to get it there. So I split the reads and the writes from each other. And in a similar vein, you could also decouple your backends from your frontends. Every time something happens in your backend, create an event, goes to the broker, is read from the broker, it's put in an uh, in memory caching, and the in memory caching is read by the uh, frontend systems. And that way you have a decoupling from backend to frontend. So you can do all these patterns, combine them, play with them, and you can do away with a lot of the complexity that we have today. In IT, like with okay, we need to do batch management, we need to transfer files from A to B, and then we have issues with our batch windows. This is this is theory, but it's also a discussion that we currently have with some of our customers. It's like, oh, we're moving to the cloud. But, oh, we need file transfer. No, you don't need file transfer. You need to get rid of file transfer. How can we get rid of file transfer? Well, you can. This way, you can. For 99%. There's always that one percent. So this is an example of an end-to-end -end reactive application landscape, so using events. So I have my front-end microservices here, I have my back-end microservices here, I have an event broker in between. What happens is any state change that happens, which is kind of like when a front-end microservice calls with an API directly a write transaction in a back-end system, well, every state change is put on the uh, event-driven architecture. In this red and it's put in memory. So when a front-end system reads something, it's going to do the in-memory caching. Okay. And when it wants to write something, it's going to kick off with an API, an orchestration microservice, who orchestrates all the changes that need to happen in the different systems, either directly through APIs, could be. In this case, I chose now where we buy events because it's maybe not uh, time sensitive. At the same moment, this information is now also available to be put in a data lake or, if necessary, to bring it to the legacy application. So this is a kind of a way where you can have complete data between your front and your backends. Your backends and your frontends can uh, basically change uh, at different speeds, and so it's an enablement of what's called a remote model that exists already for a number of years. Yeah? So you have a lot of flexibility there. So now we have um, taken the, the uh, event management into account. So now we have a really nice stack here. Um, so are we sort of done here? Huh? We are done. That's right. Huh? Well, one more thing. Huh? It's uh, security. Huh? What about that? What about that? Well, historically, we have uh, three layers of security. You have like cross brain security. Who are you? Do I know you? When you wake up and somebody lies next to you and you have to ask that question, it was a really good party. 
Um, then you have medium uh, security, it's like, can you access me? Is it okay for you to do something with me? And the fine grain security is like, okay, can you actually do this action, like transfer so much money? And in a classical uh, uh, environment, uh, the course grain is going to happen typically in your demilitarized zone, close to the internet, so like, okay, I don't know who you are, first tell me who you are. So once I know your heart, okay, now I can let you do an application. Now the application needs to say, well, you can accept me as an application. And then within the application, the business logic says, yes, you can transfer 5 million euros to Russia. This is the classical way, which is application um, uh, level security. But modern security now augments this with what we call attribute-based access control. Anybody knows who that is? Okay, a couple of people. You see if Hans did that. Uh, so what is access based um, access, um, attribute based access control? What you're going to look at is the context of the request. So it's a kind of a context based access, not just your identity, not just who you are and what you can do there. But it's going to look at the metadata of the event or of the API um, and also to the content potentially to make a decision like, yes, I'm going to let you do or not. Yes, Peter, you can access your account but not from Afghanistan, for example. Or yes, you can transfer that amount of money, but uh, you can transfer money, but not 3 million euros type of thing. So um, this is all the metadata and the data that's actually in your requests that can be used. And the advantage is you can put it at different points in your layer architecture. So this is the API layers, it's the same as the microservice layers that I've shown you before where you use, for example, the, uh, uh, the sidecar, uh, the, the thing that helps you in the service mesh, as a policy enforcement point. So when you come through as an external customer through the API gateway, it may say, well, depending on the time of the day, the location that you are, uh, in addition to your identity, I'm going to route you to A or to B. Uh, microservice. You could have different microservices to do, for example, A-B testing. Uh, um, or to say like, oh, I'm going to upcharge you versus uh, downcharge you. Uh, um, in the process level, uh, which process I sent you, or the activity, the actual business logic, or the data. So I could have policy, enf policy enforcement points on each of these layers. Now, I also need to have then the rules behind that. This could also be distributed. So like, okay, this is more like the functional, uh, this is about accessing, this is more about executing, and we have different rules, which may also be managed by different tribes or the, uh, divisions in the organization, and in the end you have the administration. So what you do is, you have a kind of centralized management, but a decentralized execution making that focuses on data level security on top of your identity. So it's a much richer authentication mechanism that can be used. Of course, there's other security mechanisms too, but I want to focus on this one. Um, so now we have a full stack, I would say, of um, uh, by adding this act, uh, attribute based access control to our platform that we need to create. What was it again? Oh, we wanted to have Fast back to market, a composable application platform where we can uh, quickly orchestrate new customer journeys together. This is what it takes today. Now, that doesn't mean it's simple, but it is the thing that today is the way that we do it. Um, this is often a lot helped by functionality that you can get from your cloud providers, uh, where this is much more invasive. But the important thing here is to look at the whole story, that you don't just look at an individual technology as an API gateway in isolation or at an API, making APIs also in isolation, but you do it with a view, what am I actually trying to achieve for the company as a whole? How does this help the company be faster, better, stronger, huh? and all these things that I've been talked about? Um, so now we're sort of done and we have this whole platform. So we're done. We uh, have arrived at the finish. Express can help you with arriving at the finish. But that's why we're here. We're here to help you. And yeah, we're almost at the end of the day. You could, you could have visited us at our booth or you can contact me for a private performance and I'm open for any questions. 
Thank you. I have the question for you. So you talked about attribute uh, level access. We've lived with API gateways with RPAC authorization, authentication, but that security at data level, that was very interesting. Can you elaborate how can that be done? Well, there are tools that help you with that. Um, there's probably things that you can program inside your gateway if your gateway doesn't support it, or you put something even in front or behind your gateway that uh, does it that does support it. So typically, what you would do is to say like, okay, you have a role-based access control. Okay, you're either the boy, you're a customer of, let's say, we have a party bar for this, right? And then it looks at my request. Uh, something, a piece of code looks at my request and says, oh, um, I'm interested in uh, this API that you called, like the transfer money. And then you could look at the amount. And then you say, hmm, this amount I'm going to send to a policy decision point. Policy decision point, together with my identity, will take a decision around, like, oh, will I allow you to do that or not? And the advantage is it does it already at the whole entrance level. You don't have to go all the way down before you do it. Now, where you put which functionality in this type of attribute-based access control, um, that's also an architectural question. Huh? It's, and that is where uh, capability, uh, business capability maps can help you say which type of decision, attribute-based decision, can you do. Um, location, like if you live in Mechula, I'm going to send you to a microservice for the office of Mechula. If you say, hey, I have microservices, per restaurant, if you're a restaurant, or per branch, and so on and so on. So these are all things that help you with that routing, and that can be implemented in any type of gateway, or as I said, in, in um, a, a sidecar. And there are actually tools that uh, help you with this type of, that are productized, uh, and help you with these type of decisions. Thank you. That was a good answer. So one more question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, in the events, uh, uh, case management is one of the use cases for events. Sure. Uh, my question is, with tools like BPM that come with user forms, deadlines, escalation management, why would one want to build case management using microservices and not BPM tools? Would you have like monolithical BPM tools? You could still use that as uh, one of your legacy, what I call them the legacy applications with monolithic things. Uh, I would be happy to sell you one. Um, but you have case management tools that you can just build into your uh, microservice. As I said, like if Camunda, everybody knows Camunda as a VPN tool, but it's also a case management tool. So you could have case management implemented per domain, per business domain. So that, like, instead of having one big monolithic case management tool that's managed by a team in IT that is overloaded because it has to service all the case management uh, implementations. And just within my tribe, I'm going to have a squad that does it for my tribe and just only for my tribe. And I'm going to actually deploy as many case management microservices for uh, any case that I have. So I'm going to maybe have one case management microservice per type of case that I want to do. You know, if I'm a, a, an insurance company, I might have a case management microservice for car accidents. I might have a case management service for life, uh, non-life, all these type of things. This is all, again, this is architecture. This is where you decide how flexible you want to be, and the tools are there. And in this type of architecture, you have this modularity that's in there where you can quickly create um, new customer journeys based on much more flexibility and without having to move to big legacy monolithic applications. Thank you. Cheers. All right. Then I think we can close this session. Thank you very much.